All right. Well, Lisa, I'm so excited to talk to you. You were my first guest from South Africa. And I just, I love that (laughs) this podcast is reaching and that we're sort of uniting, right? As this global community of women who have this shared experience. And um, I love that. So I have so many questions for you, but I will, I will start out with the one I often start out with, which is, um, you know, you were really recently diagnosed. So I'm curious Mm. kind of what was going on in your life that led you to start putting these pieces together and start connecting the dots that this was ADHD? I think for me, it's, it's twofold. The first part is, which is very common, which is what I've heard in your podcast is that my daughter, there were questions raised at her school. She's six years old. Um, and when she was five, her, her teacher called us to the school and just said, she's doing great, but she's just, uh, daydreaming a lot and not really concentrating and we just had to kind of watch out for it. And at the time I just, I felt very defensive and I felt I kind of had a bias against the whole ADHD thing. And I thought, you know, they just out to medicate our kids. And I felt very like against that kind of, that whole thing. Cause I had the stereotype in my head drilled in and, um, I ignored it. And then the, this year she's, she's six now and a second teacher, different teacher said the same thing. And she said that she's, you know, um, doodling in class and singing and daydreaming. And I thought, hang on, I used to be like that as a kid. And I kind of did, I started doing some research online and realizing that I was exactly the same as a kid. And I kind of, I had a very dysfunctional childhood and upbringing. It was like a lot of, there was domestic abuse. There was alcoholism. There was like a whole you name it, like it was bad. So anything that I kind of, where I failed in life or I didn't really do well at school or as a kid, I always just kind of put it in that bucket. And I'm like, oh, well, it's just that, oh, it was just a troubled kid. You know, that's why I didn't concentrate. That's why I blah, 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 um, fill in the blank. And then the other part of it is that I've been working in corporate for 17 years and I've recently become (laughs) self-employed. I don't have the structure anymore. And I'm almost like a like a fish without water. And I've just been, I've kind of, it's almost like, um, heading for like a mental breakdown. And I don't think they call it that anymore, but where you, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I really want to do yoga mindfulness. I had this whole idea of, you know, what business I was going to have. And my partner, um, he is supporting me. And for the first time I'm not earning a salary, which is freaking me out, but he's fine with it. Um, but I, I find myself hopping from one thing to the next because I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I need to do this. And then I I kind of just dance around a whole bunch of things and then end up not doing anything. And so I was in that space at the same time this was happening with my daughter. And then I just did some research. And then I think my my algorithms changed because I just started seeing all this stuff on TikTok. <laughs> and I was just like, no, this is way too relatable. And then... Yeah, I I came across your podcast and I listened to it for about a month and then I was like, okay, I need to get evaluated. And I got evaluated and yes, I am ADHD uh, type inattentive. And um, I actually just went to my psychiatrist today to get meds so that I'm going to try out because I used to be really against medication, but now I'm, I don't know, I'm of the opinion if something can like have the potential to change my life, then I'm willing to try it. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, at least I tried it. So, mm-hmm. and I'm going to try my first pull tomorrow. So yeah, <laughs> I'm very excited. Your I'm first, nervous. your first, yeah. sorry, your first, my pull. first dosage. Yeah. Oh, dose. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, oh, wow. Okay, great. Now, which yes. medication yeah. is it that you're trying? It is Nucon. I think it's um, the same. I think it's the same as Ritalin. Okay. They, they call it Ritalin, but I don't know if, if it's the same in the US, but, but they call it that side. Um, yeah, I think it's it's the way she, the, the doctor prescribed it. It's like a slow release, 12 hour um, story that you, you can kind of, it's more fluid, like you don't have to take it every day and which appeals to me because I'm already on antidepressants and, um, you know, antidepressants are a big commitment. So you can't just mm-hmm. not take them if you don't feel like it because you get really horrible uh, withdrawals and stuff. So I'm quite in- happy that this is a like a take it or leave it kind of medication, which is nice. Mm-hmm. So. 
Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. I feel like I talk a lot about my own journey with medication too, and sort of mm -hmm. always asking like, what does it mean when people say it's working? Right. Cause I'm sort of, I still <laughs> sort of have that sense of like, I don't even know what I'm looking for, um, yeah. a lot of the time. And so there's so many questions that can rise around medication and, um, and make it just, you know, it, it's it's a lot more difficult to just say I'm either for medication or anti-medication. I'm not yeah. anti-medication at all. I'm of the same opinion of you, which is like, look, if, you know, if it's going to help, absolutely. I want to bring in as many things in my toolbox as I possibly can, but it's not that exactly. simple. <laughs> no, it's not. Right? Unfortunately, yeah. no, no. And also with children too, like I have that same impulse, you know, and I don't know, I think that impulse to say like, are do you just want to medicate my child so that they will conform yeah. to your classroom environment? It's, it's difficult mm -hmm. because I think on the one hand, it, yeah, it can be tremendously helpful, but at the same time, a lot of the time, the, the, um, what's the word? Like the, the motivation to medicate is often feels not right. You know, like sometimes yes. I get really frustrated where I'm like, are we medicating because, of, you know, that, that our, we want our kids to be quiet and, and be sitting in a classroom and we have these expectations mm -hmm. of them that are unrealistic versus like, what's the best way to help our child right now in the situation mm -hmm. that we have right now. So it is, there's, it's, it, it is complicated. And anybody who says it isn't is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> it's very layered because like, what if my daughter just happens to not enjoy her teaching style or what if she doesn't enjoy the subject does that mean that that's should be medication like sh is medication the solution there it's it's all very yeah it's mm -hmm. very layered but yeah yeah I <laughs> at know. the same time um at the same time when i spoke to my psychiatrist today about it she said that um medication could actually be very helpful for my daughter because it can build her self-esteem up and it, it might, because I was worried. I said, is it okay to give medication to a, a brain that's not developed yet? And she said that it's actually on the plus, it's like, it is it is good because it might change the way it develops. And in the long run, she won't need to be on medication. And so I kind of, well, I thought, well, I've never heard it that way before. So I am considering it, but I think I'm going to be the guinea pig first, seeing that we have the same genes. I want to see how I react to it and then we'll take it from there. But, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I do take a lot of, um, as, as I think about my own children, because they're going through the diagnosis process right now. And so mm -hmm. I'm sort of questioning, you know, what comes after that? What is their treatment plan going to mm -hmm. be? And, mm -hmm. um, and I like the idea uh, that it is one of the more researched medications out there for yes. children, right? So I feel yes. like um, it's not, just something that's been thrown onto the market really, really quickly. Yes. <laughs> so I yes. do take a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, consolation in that. And, and I like yeah. that idea too, that it's, you know, cause I've talked about that too with, um, with my husband and like, you know, the, the fear of labeling a child with ADHD and what that can mean mm. for them in school and the stigma. And, you know, we often have that conversation, which is like, well, they're going to get labeled either way. So do they mm. get labeled with something that is potentially can give them help in accommodations and mm. can, can provide them answers as to who they are and why they are the way they are, or will they get the label of lazy or scatterbrained or all the labels that we had growing up? Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. And, and, it's and, very and, painful. Right. It's very yeah. painful to have those labels. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, on the one hand, I feel like, uh, at, at, when it's placed, when it's put that way, I would much rather have an actual diagnosis where we can sort of mm -hmm. say, okay, what's the help you need? What do you need? What do you need to succeed right now? As opposed to what I had, which was just try harder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could do it. You really could do it, you know, if, if you, you wanted you know. to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's interesting yeah. also thinking about you, you know, you talking about having a traumatic childhood and, and those questions that are also mm. brought into it. Right. Which is, yes. Um, God, how do we even start to answer those? I don't know. Um, I think I, so many of us do have trauma in our childhood. And so I think it is mm. interesting to explore kind of how our brain and our nervous system changes and reacts yes. to childhood yes. trauma. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I'm curious. You had also mentioned in, when you emailed me that you were, uh, I guess, diagnosed codependent or, or how does that yep. work? That you had sort of been going through a codependency 12 step program. What, yes. when, when, when did that happen in your life? Um, it was actually just before the pandemic. Um, it was so 
Yeah, I mean, to kind of explain it is my mom was in a, a raging codependent and she obviously had her issues that made her that way. I mean, her mother was a bipolar schizophrenic and so she would um, have these exploding moments, manic, like quite highs and then low lows. And I think my mom learned to walk on eggshells and um, read the room and constantly take te her temperature, her emotional temperature or energy of the vibe of the room. And so she, she learned to live that way. And then she kind of had, uh, had the same kind of men in her relationship with explosive tempers. So um, like domestic violence and alcoholism and all of that was rife with all her, her marriages. And she was married three times. And so I learned from her. So it's kind of like a generational thing mm -hmm. um, in a sense where you, you learn, it's learned behaviors on how to have relationships and how to like um, interact with other people. And it's also how you kind of survive in that environment. Um, the best way you can is you develop codependency tendencies, but it's not an official um, mental illness, I don't think. It's, but it is a phenomenon that, you know, that a lot of people from 12-step programs, um, Aldenon, um, AA, NA, they, they actually end up in CODA, which is the 12-step program for Codependence Anonymous. Because when I go to meetings, there's a lot of them, a lot of the, the members mention that they come from another fellowship and they realize that that was actually their problem. Their addiction was relationships. And it's almost, I, I feel like I have watched, listened, read some articles on codependency and ADHD and how they work together. And it's quite fascinating, if, especially when I look back at my relationships. Um, I was very impulsive and, but, impulsive in a way where I would mirror what they are doing and say that my, my boyfriend had a hobby, you know, he was a surfer or a skater or a gamer, whatever he did, I would do because I was codependent and I felt like I needed to be like him and that was right. And when you have ADHD, a lot of the time you question what is right and what's wrong. And, and I always felt like I was wrong, inherently wrong. No matter what I do, I'm wrong. And it's almost like I look to others to tell me what I should do and shouldn't do. And so every single relationship I was in, I would chameleon myself. And it was just, it was very impulsive, which is the ADHD part where I would just like, okay, now I'm, I'm this person now. I'm going to cut my hair. I'm going to get tattoos. I'm going to start smoking weed. I'm like, you know, I'm going to be whatever you need me to be right now. And then I look back at my relationships and it's just, it's like, it's cringy to think about it. Like even in high school, I was a total pick me girl. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of it's got to do with the low self-esteem and it's just, it's not just codependency, um, on its own. And it's, it's very, it was a big relief for me to figure that out because I felt like, like, yes, I am codependent, but there's something else. There is something else and I don't know what it is. And that's where the whole, um, ADHD thing comes in. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know if I answered your question. I just feel like I rambled. Well, no, it is. I mean, it's, yeah. it's brought up a thousand more questions, right? Because I think about how <laughs> that journey of the, of learning more about ADHD in adulthood, like brings mm -hmm. about that way that we look over the course of our life through this new realization yeah. and this new lens. Yeah. Right. And I, th I feel like I think that way about, you know, my relationship with my body image and my relationship with yeah. eating and dieting and, and all of those ways, it's the same idea, right? That same need for reinvention, that same need of like escaping who we are fundamentally. And so yes. it's, you know, and that, that idea of like, oh God, when you were talking, you made me re remember a conversation I had had with Katie Osoris and in her interview where we were actually talking about like sexual relationships, but she was talking about mm -hmm. how difficult it is, it is for us to be at the wheel in relationships right? Like it's so much yeah. easier for us to allow the other person to be in charge because then the, the, the onus is off of us to di from disappointing mm -hmm. them. Right. And we're yes. so afraid of disappointing others that it's much easier for us to be sort of the follower or, or just, you know, the, the, um, more passive person in the relationship. And so it reminded me mm -hmm. of that thinking about the way in which that kind of combines with the impulsivity and the reinvention and that desire mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. to, not, you know, just fundamentally not be who we are <laughs> yes. uh, because of that disappointment. And, and, um, 
But at the same time, like how, yeah, it makes total sense why we would want somebody else to decide for us, like what we like and, and who we are and, and how we're going to look and how it, how we do have that tendency to kind of latch onto people in that way. Um, yeah. especially strong personalities and, and, you know, unfortunately abusive personalities too. Yes. Uh, well, they can smell it a mile away. They can right. smell it a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I'm now, okay if you're okay. So that means... Right. Yeah, We're no like matter. magnets. <laughs> yeah. Now looking back and mm -hmm. through this new lens of ADHD, um, I, I'm curious about looking back at your own childhood, but also, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned your grandmother who was bipolar schizophrenic and then your mother. Yes. So, so I'm like, this must be so mind blowing to you to think yes. about the genetic component of all of this. Yes. Uh, is your, is, now your mother's not around either. My mother also passed no. away and I, I also feel like she's the one person I want to have this conversation with, right? Because yes. I, I feel Same. like she really struggled with who I was as a child too. And she struggled mm. to help me. And so there is, mm. I feel that, that grief doubly, you know, where I'm like, oh God, I wish I could have these conversations with her. Um, but I'm, I, I'm curious look, for you, like looking back at your childhood, what are some of the things that you look back at and think, oh my goodness, the signs were there <laughs> all along. Um, I remember being told like since I was five, six, that I was lazy and messy and forgetful. And they used to call me in Afrikaans, it's called loskop, and it means your head is lost, like literally lost. And I was, I remember daydreaming a lot and watching a movie and then being in class and just like, reenacting the movie in my head or I would picture myself doing everyone's hair and what it would look like. Like I would go to this like vivid imagination and then I would look down and realize I hadn't done any work. And at one point I remember, I think I was about seven. I remember in our workbooks, I, I glued the pages together so that when they flipped through my book, they didn't see any incomplete pages. <laughs> and oh. it took like a, a whole year for the teacher to figure out what I was doing. <laughs> And I just remember my mom was like kind of impressed. <laughs> um, I remember just, I remember having a habit of forgetting, losing things and forgetting to take my lunch out of my bag um, or out of my locker at school. And I remember on one occasion, I think I was about nine and I left like a, a sandwich or something in my bag and we had school holidays. We were on break. And then it was like the first day we were going to go back the night before we were busy packing my bag and we opened up my bag and this cockroaches came out my bag and it was like something out of the mummy. It was, they filled the room and my mom was like screaming and we were like, just trying to vacuum them up. And it was just, I used to do shit like that all the time. I would <laughs> just always forget things. Um, and then obviously I think when I, when I was about high school, I remember being told a lot that you have so much potential and even through, you know, in a working environment, I remember people saying to me like, well, why are you working in this role? Like it's beneath, it's, it's almost like it was beneath me and I, I would be offended and be like, well, what do you mean? And I think people, the way I, people would receive me was like, I am smarter than what I'm doing or well, they expected more than me than what I was doing at the time. And I just felt so like irritated because I was like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? What do you think I should do? And it's almost like I needed them to tell me what to do, um, which is where the codependency comes in, mm -hmm. uh, which didn't help. Um, I thinking what else I actually made like a whole list and now I can't remember it, <laughs> but yeah, those were mostly the childhood things. Um, and I think as I got older, it was more, it was relationships. I think I seek that novelty and the, re the validation from relationships. And it was like the little dopamine hits and I would go for, I think I thrived best in environments and working environments where I was super busy and doing like a hundred things at once. And there was so much pressure and I would bitch about it and moan about it, but I felt alive and I felt like, you know, like there was no time to sit. And when for me being idle, it's very dangerous. I feel like I can go to a very dark place if I'm idle long enough because I just sit and think and I think and I think and I think and, you know, and then all the negative, like, you know, voices start coming and not literal voices, but like negative thoughts. And it's just, you know, what are you doing? And you're wasting your time on, you know, especially with my business. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, building it up now. So it's still very new and I'm just putting pressure on myself. Like you can't believe. And 
if things are quiet and if I don't have a lot of clients for that day, then it's all of a sudden like it's the end of the world and no, I shouldn't be doing this. I should write a book. And I, it's just like, I go from one thing to the next. And I think one of my biggest pains is having great big ideas and then no follow through on them. And what else? The other thing would be my hobbies. Yeah. I have a hobby of starting new hobbies, <laughs> which is, I have like a workshop, we turn our garage into a workshop and there's just like so much crafting tools and like little Dremel kits and like jewelry making and clay and painting and sculpting and yeah, everything, which is great because my daughter loves messing around all that stuff with me, but yeah, it's, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, mm. That's definitely one of the ones I've had to reframe for myself. Uh, the My hobby mm. is trying new things yeah, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, always getting down on myself for all of my unfinished projects and, mm. um, you know, always sort of switching directions halfway through something. And oh my goodness, I related to so much of that. And I, mm. I, when you had also in your email to me, you had mentioned that you had 11 different jobs in 17 yes. years. And I was like, yes. I should probably count how many I had because <laughs> I probably had a similar, um, you know, and I often talked about like not being able to work someplace for longer than two years for, mm. for various mm. reasons. But you were, yes. said you were working in corporate. So I'm curious yes. how you ended up there and then how yoga entered your life. <laughs> <laughs> I was... Okay, a lot of my journey was just mostly survival. So I, I moved out really early. I was 17. Mm -hmm. And so I, and there was no money for like university or anything like that. So everything was just, you know, entry level job, secretary, receptionist, anything I could take basically. But then as I got more comfortable and as I got, you know, I would work my way up in a company, I would just reach this point of a can board now and I would start to get complacent. And then, you know, maybe I should do this, maybe I should. And then I would eventually just leave. And yeah, that would, I think it would be two, three years tops. And I, um, I think, what did I do? I went to one of the biggest online shopping, um, after my divorce, my daughter was two weeks old when we went through a divorce. So I was like left with a newborn <laughs> and I was, it was incredibly like life changing for me and traumatic at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I'm happy for it now, obviously. But at the time it felt like, you know, the carpet had been ripped from under me and I had to get my shit together. So I was like, okay, I need to get in a good company. I need to get a better job. And so I did all of that. And I was highly motivated for the first time in my life to like really just, cause I was the relationship I was in, he earned more than me and I had a comfortable job, but I wasn't really pushing, you know, to get more money or anything. That was never an issue for me. But then when I was alone, I was like, okay, I have to, you know, be a, boss babe or whatever you want to call it. And, um, I got into one of the, the biggest online, like e-com, uh, companies. And I, I did something very like menial. I think it was, um, just dealing with suppliers. And then there were engineers on the same floor as us. And I just remember watching them and it always looked so cool. And, you know, like software developers with their little Funko pops and it just, it looked so, you know, exciting. Um, and I started training there in my like shadow shadowing and during my lunch breaks. And then I eventually got in there as a software tester and then I loved it. And it was, I was definitely not the smartest in the room when it comes to computer science and machine learning and all that kind of stuff. But that was, it like fed me and it really, I loved it. Um, and then the pandemic happened <laughs> and I ended up working from home. And then, yeah, it was just, and yeah. I didn't, I realized, I realized that I, I wasn't getting my little dopamine hits because I wasn't seeing people and nobody could see what I was doing. And mm. there was no like, you know, um, and I realized yeah, a lot of what I was getting out of that job was like that validation that you get from people. And when you're working on your own, left to your own devices and nobody's watching you, then I just got lazy and I was just like, oh, and I got demotivated. <laughs> um, and then I started, we started doing yoga. We had a private instructor come to us during the week just to like change our days up because we were so bored. And uh, I really loved it. And I felt like, wow, this is amazing. And I felt, felt so like in bliss. And I felt like, why can't I do this every day? You know, um, I'd rather much be doing that than sitting 
in front of a laptop the entire day. And I was just really like resentful towards, I don't know. It was almost like I was just wanted to join the great resignation. And I was just like, I'm joining them and that's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm against capitalism and everything. And so I was like, um, I'm just going to do a yoga course and there's a yoga studio right around the corner from my house, walking distance. I was like, it's a sign from the universe, you know, and then I'm, I'm not even going to think about it. I'm just going to do it because I didn't want to talk myself out of it. So I just did it. And then I started, um, I did the certification and then I got my online, uh, site growing up because I wanted to do online yoga and focus on that. And that's where I am right now <laughs> in the building stages of everything. Um, yeah, yeah it's, well, I mean, I, I it's got ADHD written all over it, right? Where it's yes. just sort of like, um, you know, getting super passionate and wanting to then, you know, be an entrepreneur, but at the same time being an entrepreneur, which so many of us are comes with like its whole other <laughs> basket of, <laughs> of issues. Yes. Yes. Um, because you know, on the, on the one hand, it, it really is like you, it, it's so much, uh, I don't know what the word is. Like there's so much, um, motivation and there's so much like mm -hmm. energy, uh, finding your passion, but so keeping, sustaining that momentum can be really yes. difficult for so many of us, uh, especially without the instant validation of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I remember one of the like most sobering, um, pieces of advice I ever got from a business coach was like, she, she used to say to me, um, you know, it's really quite uh, deluded to think that you can be as successful as somebody who's been doing this for five years, 10 years. Right. And exactly. had she just, I don't know if she said deluded, but it was, you know, it was just that idea of like, she really kind of made me think, look in the mirror and think about like my own expectations of myself mm. and my own expectations of my business. And, um, you know, we're so impatient <laughs> when it comes to growth, <laughs> yes. right. That we want to be, we want to be immediately <laughs> successful. And so it's really difficult to have your own business mm. when, when mm -hmm. that does, is not always the case. And if it is the case, good for you. But I think, you know, mm. it's, um, that's certainly something I struggle with all the time, which is, you know, always, and then waking up one day and just being like, um, you know, that, that imposter syndrome always, of, yes. you know, uh, is a, you know, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot there, <laughs> but no, it's I, I, get, I totally get that. I mean, I would do a session and feel amazing and I'd be like, wow, I really enjoyed that. And I felt like this is what I'm meant to be doing. And I get all excited about it. And then the next day I'll be like, shit, I don't think, I don't think I should do this. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I could just go highs and lows. And all it takes is like one moment or one quiet day. And then I'm in my mind, overthinking, ruminating, and then I, I want to not do it anymore. Yeah, That's, I know. Right. Yeah. And I, I was really taken, I think it was, maybe it was, a on your website, there was somewhere where you had talked about like wanting to, um, you know, just to, what was that word? Just like that, that the struggle with, um, that, that you have had your whole life with, with mm. depression and body image and, uh, worthiness, I think was the word you used too, which really struck mm -hmm. me like this yoga is such an incredible tool for those things. And, and so I, I, I see how, like, for me, it's been so beneficial and I, you know, I, mm. I immediately want to help somebody else. Right. I think we have that really deep empathy, which is like, yes. I, this has been such an amazing tool for me. I want to, I want to, if I can help one other woman, you know, mm. with these issues, <laughs> it will have all been worth it. Um, and I certainly relate to a lot of the issues that, you know, with, with, the yoga body. Right. And, and that idea yes. that there is a certain, you know, that, that somebody who is quote unquote good or successful or t can teach yoga must look a certain way and how we have to talk exactly. ourselves out of that as well. Right. Which is like, I, I did a post a, a couple of years ago on, on, um, just, you know, reminding myself mostly, but reminding others that like the reason why you don't, the reason why you see a certain body type more than others isn't because they're better at yoga. It's because they have more confidence to show themselves <laughs> because of the society in which we live in. Right. And so the other people True. are marginalized for a reason. The other body sizes are marginalized for a reason. It has nothing to do with how good you are at yoga. And, um, I have to remind myself that all the time. And I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, so oh, I, I struggle a lot. I, 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 I don't actually like telling people what I do 
Because as soon as I do, I get the eyeball and they look at me up and down and there's this confusion on their face. <laughs> like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm like, I practice, I'm a mindful yoga practitioner. And then they look at me and look me up and down. And then there's just this awkward silence. And then it's just like, okay, let's change the subject. Mm. Um, and it, it just, it really wrecks my self-esteem. And I had to just keep reminding myself that that's not why I'm doing yoga. I'm really... Um, I mean, a lot of people enjoy yoga for, as a form of exercise and they do hot yoga and they sweat it out, which is great. But I feel like, um, or like yoga closer to its origins is more about like breath and mindfulness and just that like ultimate amazing feeling that everybody gets when they're in that space. And it's just so difficult to market that because it's not like productive where mindfulness is not seen as productive. It's a very quiet, subtle thing that happens. And, you know, like power yoga is like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm being productive. I'm burning calories. I'm getting, you know, this hot yoga bod. And it seems like, you know, it's, it's worth your time and money. And I think especially as a woman, it's like if you do anything for yourself, especially if you're a mom, it's like you feel guilty. So if you do something for yourself, it better be productive. And that's the kind of like world we live in. But nobody does things just because it, feels good or it's good for their, I don't know, mindfulness or I don't know. And I'm, I really struggle with that. It's a lot of, I think the whole, I don't know if it's, I hate labels, but codependence or ADHD is, is me trying to like, I, instead of looking at the audience and seeing, okay, what do they want? I'm focusing on, okay, what do I want to offer? What is authentic to me? And just hoping that I'll attract the people that want it. And it's, but it's, uh, I think it's trusting that process is scary and it's just trusting that somebody is like, they want what you have to offer and just standing by your kind of truth is like, this is what I'm offering. And that's it. I don't look like a yogi, but I'm not in it for that. <laughs> I'm in it to like get you mindful and get mindful with you and like have that amazing kind of like, I don't know if you want to call it spiritual or like mindful, whatever, but like have that experience that you get. Um, and I think especially, it's just so ironic that I'm in the mindfulness space because I have ADHD and it's like, <laughs> it makes no sense. Um, but that's why I started make, like making uh, sessions on my side that are like express mindfulness. So it's like 30 minute sessions <laughs> as opposed to like an hour because we can't like, you know, we can't sit for that long. And I, I think it's adjusting your expectations and that, yes, you can have bite-sized mindfulness, you know, um, you can just walk in the park and be mindful. You can do anything, make a cup of tea mindfully. So I think it's just about like changing the narrative, I guess, not being so like stringent and serious about it. I, I used to be very all or nothing. And it's like, if I can't sit and meditate on a hill for an hour, then I've suck, you know, but now mm -hmm. I'm kind of lowering my expectations and realizing I can get little bite-sized stuff <laughs> throughout my day. <laughs> well, that's one thing I think that always appealed to me about yoga, even, you know, 25 years ago, long before I was diagnosed was that I, mm. I saw the value in meditation. I just couldn't mm. sit still. And so yoga sort of felt like the, the best of both worlds where I could yeah. continually move, but still have the mm. benefits of the stillness and the mindfulness. And I think also, like you said about, you know, it, trusting yourself is so scary, right? And 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 mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've benefited the most from with my relationship with yoga over the years is is that ability to tune in to who I am, uh, uh, my authentic self, right? And, and so mm -hmm. I think it makes sense that when we have ADHD, or like you said, like as you're trying to kind of parse through, like what is ADHD? What is the trauma of childhood? What is the codependency? Mm -hmm. Like that same theme of self-trust and lack of self-trust runs for so many of us, right? We don't, we know like who we fundamentally are was, was labeled wrong. And so we stopped thinking that we knew what was best for ourselves. And you see yes. that theme a lot in our, in, in a lot of ways for women, right? We, you know, like eating, for instance, you know, we're, we're taught mm -hmm. that the way that we naturally eat is wrong, that we have to change that. We have to follow new diets and, and, um, you know, who our body, is, what our body is, is naturally wrong. We have to make it smaller and be more, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be uh, more, um, uh, we have to like behave and, and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like we have to, um, conform and, so anyway, so, you know, I think the one thing that is so powerful about yoga, especially for people with ADHD, is that it's it's such a wonderful way to build that muscle in ourselves to trust 
what who we are right in that yeah. slowness and to kind of trust what is what feels right in our body and mm-hmm. um i think that's something that is so powerful for me like i know that when i'm having bad days where i'm just like oh you're a failure you're fat you're ugly you're stupid like yoga is one of those things that really kind of brings me back to how powerful i am, you know, and, and how powerful Mm -hmm. my body is. And just like, it gets me out of my head and kind of into the wisdom of my body for lack of a better word, like, you know, just that, that full connection of, of the wisdom Mm -hmm. of like what is, feels right. And, and the, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting tripped on my words. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly (laughs) what you mean. But that (laughs) idea of self-trust, I think can be really, uh, it's something that can be achieved really um, beautifully with, with yoga, if you can shed, if you can get rid of all of that desire for power yoga and all that bullshit about yes, like yes. using it as exercise, but like really what it's that sort of mind body connection, which is the, the name yoga, right? Union. So um, exactly, <laughs> it, it is amazing to me. And I'm often sometimes like proud of the fact that I came to yoga, um, authentically like, or, or, um, uh, what's the word? Like, um, organically, you know, that even without an ADHD diagnosis, you know, those tools Mm -hmm. that you kind of bring into your toolbox over the course of your life that Mm -hmm. you got even before you had a diagnosis, right? Yeah. 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 And so I I feel like, you know, it's um, those of us who kind of use yoga or even like CBT is another one. So many of us Mm -hmm. have gotten, you know, um, have kind of organically found cognitive behavioral therapy or just the ways in which I'm like, yeah, you know what? I was taking care of myself all along in the best mm-hmm. way I knew how at the time. Yes. Right. Yes. So yes, um, it is so powerful. It's funny. It's, uh, I was speaking to my therapist about it. She was saying how, um, that I've gotten this far without knowing that I've had the diagnosis and I've clearly built up like coping mechanisms. And I didn't realize that I have, I was like, well, what are the coping mechanisms? And I kind of went through my like life and I realized like with time, I'm very, I could I have high anxiety when I have to be somewhere in a certain time. Like even for this, for this podcast, I was like the whole day, I'm like, <laughs> I mustn't forget. I must forget. And I was like, you know, like <laughs> hours before the time. And it's like getting my daughter to bed early. I'm like, go to sleep. I have to do the podcast now. <laughs> and I was just like having this like anxiety until the moment. It's like, mm-hmm. I will not let myself think of anything else. And I realized like, that's a coping mechanism. Like that's how I've managed to, to be on time for things and do things is because I drive myself crazy with it. And normal people will just be like, oh, it's about that time. And they do the thing. It's like, I wish I could live in a world where I did that. Like, um, um, I think every interview I've ever been in, I've, I've always been like an hour early. Um, if I think about it now and I've, I've always thought, okay, well, I'm, I can't be ADHD cause I'm, I'm not late for anything, but I think it's because I have built a big coping mechanism around that. And perhaps my grandfather was ADD because my mom ADHD, because my mom told me that when they were kids, they used to go um, to the drive-in and he would drive away um, with them in the car before the movie had finished because he was worried about the traffic building up. So they would always <laughs> miss the end of the movie and they would watch it through the window outside leaving. <laughs> and I was like, that is just like me. I would do some shit like that. And yeah, so the coping mechanisms are funny. That's really interesting. It's true. Mm. Plus Mm. we hate traffic. I don't know about you, but like sitting in traffic, sitting in any kind of lineup is enough to not even go at all. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really interesting observation. Um, but I know it was very fascinating to me too, to think about all the ways in which I didn't realize I was working so hard Mm. to do something that is seemingly effortless for other people and not realizing Mm. that it is effortless for other people. And, and I've, I think I've shared that story on other episodes about like losing things. Like I don't feel, I don't think of myself as somebody who loses my phone or my keys because I spend so much time keeping track of them. (laughs) And then the things that I do lose a lot, like I have, you know, we live in a two story house. So I have upstairs and downstairs versions of things because I lose them all the time. Right. And a lot of it has to do with like efficiency and laziness. Like I have to have Mm -hmm 
you know, cleaning, I have to have the exact same cleaning supplies upstairs and downstairs because I don't want to have to go upstairs and downstairs to get them. So I buy double of everything. But, um, but even just like my glasses, I have glasses, you know, in the car, mm. I have glasses next to the TV. Like I, I bought a bunch <laughs> of them so that I never have to worry about where they are. And, and that realization, you know, once I was getting diagnosed when I was like, oh, right. Yeah. Like no mm. wonder we're exhausted all the time. Like look at mm. how much mental effort we have to put into things that are seemingly effortless. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, that's really interesting. And yet still I have to laugh because you kind of talked about how you still battle with the imposter syndrome of the diagnosis mm. itself. Like oh, maybe yes. you, maybe you like accidentally convinced your therapist that you have ADHD. I laughed at that because I relate to that so much. Yes. But it, the, I don't know what it is. There's that like a voice in the back of my head. That's like, are you sure you weren't just convincing her that you have it, you know? And, um, and I'm like, am I that great at convincing people at things that like, and you kind of, it's almost like you have this, I don't know, like I have such a big ego that I think I'm capable of convincing a health practitioner of a, of a <laughs> diagnosis. Um, oh, I'm just looking for an excuse. You know, I just want to get medication and, you know, um, and I'm, I'm not even a, a fan of medication, so I don't know why I would even think those things. Um, yeah. But I think it goes back to that same theme of self-trust, right? Which is yes. like, I don't even know if I am the one who should be in charge of my own life. Like I, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, it's, and, and not only that, but always looking for the answers to these seemingly huge questions, yes. never feeling like things fit, you know, never, like yeah. I certainly, I've talked about like never feeling like depression really fit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and looking for the answers. And then an ADHD diagnosis comes along and it feels so convenient. It feels like yes. the answer to so many things that of course you're going to question mm -hmm. it because you're just sort of like, I don't know, I'm the kind of person who's always looking for the answer. And so, exactly. uh, right. Like, of course, I'm not going to trust this one that feels too good to be true. It feels too easy sometimes for so many of us. Right. And, and then you combine that with the fact that like, we don't usually think of ourselves as an authority of anything because we're also told our whole lives that mm. you know, <laughs> the way we see things isn't to be trusted because exactly. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I, I totally feel that way. And I often say to people like, if you feel like you have a lot of doubt around your ADHD diagnosis, it's a pretty good chance you have ADHD. Mm. <laughs> That's usually sign enough. Yeah. Well, I was fix hyper fixated on ADHD for the last month or so. So I was just like, that's enough evidence for me. The way I, I was just like stuck on this thing. And every week I have some, I think the week or the month, sorry, the months before that, um, I had heard of, um, uh, multi I don't know if you've heard of that term. No. Um, and some a woman did a TED talk on it. It's being a multi potentialite, and that means like not having one uh, interest. So it's like a you know someone that's like a lawyer, and then they're also an artist, and a this and a that. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm a multi potentialite. I don't just have one passion, and that's exciting. But then I looked at my life, and I'm like, well, I'm not successful in one thing. So <laughs> how can I call myself that? <laughs> um, yeah. So. At, at first I thought I was that. And then I'm like, man, that's not it. And then the ADHD, I, I, I don't know. I just felt like Cinderella, like the, 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 the slipper just fit. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I've, it's funny because I was trying to convince myself more than anything else. And I would, you know, go on these sites and I would do all the, the quizzes and the screenings. I'm like, just to make hundred percent sure that I'm on the right track. And then I think also the problem is I've, Again, the codependency part comes in where I start speaking to other people about it. Be like, what do you think? What do you think? And I don't know if it's just because it's South Africa, but we're still very behind when it comes to ADHD and nobody really speaks about it at all. And it's normally like a hush hush thing. And it's only for like, you know, little teenage boys or teenage boys, like kindergarten boys that are just out of order. And that's, you know, what ADHD is in South Africa. It still is like that. And I don't even know what point I was getting at now. <laughs> oh my God, I've lost So it. if you talk about ADHD, people think you can't yes. possibly have it because you're, yes. you know, and then insert I'm something positive, woman. right? Well, that's the other yeah. thing that bothers me yeah. too, is like you see how stigmatized yeah. it is in our society yeah. because people are like, you can't possibly have it. You are successful or you can't possibly have it mm. because you went to school. Like all of these things that insert positive trait and therefore yes. if there's something positive about you, you can't possibly have ADHD, which I think is something that we kind of have to really also deal with, which is like 
realizing how this has been such, like for me, this was such a revelation. It was such an incredible shift in how I viewed myself as a, mm -hmm. as a human being, but at the same time realizing that like being open about my ADHD has changed who I am to so many other people in my life who now yes. view me as this flawed person, right? This person with a diagnosis, with a disorder, and like all of the mm -hmm. ways in which people kind mm -hmm. of like almost like back away from me, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, 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 I, I sort of just have to ignore that and, and really kind yes. of focus on the fact that this is my own journey. And like, I'm not going to make anybody else understand what I'm going yes. through right now. I had to give that up really quickly because as soon as I started talking about it with other people, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you have no idea what I'm talking. <laughs> exactly, it's difficult because when you, when you, as a as someone with ADHD, when you first research something, you really do it with that like fine tooth comb, and you really like go in crazy. You go all in, and then you try to explain to someone in one like little conversation, and it's not going to come across. And it's just like I want to shake them and be like, "Do you realize how much research I've done? You don't understand." And it's like I want to explain myself to them, and I mean. What's funny is that when you try to explain yourself to someone who you think has ADHD and they say to you things like, but isn't that everyone? And I'm like, well, maybe you have it too, but I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> so it's just like, but everybody has ADHD. Tell me somebody who doesn't have, and it's just like, okay, I was kind of back off and I think realizing it's my own journey and that it's really got nothing to do with anyone else. It's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. been a, a lesson for me. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. And, and that's often the kind of the, the advice I give women who are sort of like, how do I get my parents to see what I'm going through? How do I get people in my life to see how, what I'm, what's happening to me? And I'm like, you don't, you don't. <laughs> don't. No. Uh, and my partner, he says to me, um, he says, yeah, but I, I don't want you to change. He's worried that I'm going to change on the medication and that I'm, he thinks it's like funny when I'm forgetful or, or he loves it when I get into my moods with, you know, getting into a, a new hobby and stuff. So he's worried that my personality is going to change overnight. So I'm trying to explain to him it doesn't work that way. Um, and because he laughs at me, but like, especially with my road rage, I have really bad road rage. And he thinks it's hilarious because he's just like, what is your problem? Because <laughs> I just like the cyclists, especially. Um, I don't know why. There's a lot of cyclists where I live and it's like a... <laughs> very windy narrow roads and there's there's not even a, a bicycle lane but they are on that and I was like, Where are they? <laughs> uh, yeah I'm Ricky, on the uh yeah I'm the same way about cyclists because we live in like a rural area with with very you know with curvy roads and I I'm like I'm glad mm -hmm. for you that you're out there and cycling and in theory I'm very supportive of what you're doing but oh my god I hate being stuck <laughs> behind you <laughs> <laughs> Especially when they put the hand out like that. I'm like, oh my God, you are not a car. Like, really? <laughs> um, so so I'm curious now, I mean, going through all of this, thinking about, you know, your life through this, through this new diagnosis, what is something that you love about your ADHD? Because we, we have talked a lot about mm. kind of the struggles and how crazy mm. it is, but it is, I feel like it is really transformative in so many ways. So what's something that you what love I, what i really love is the creativity part of it i feel like i can be super creative at the drop of a hat and it's just like out of the blue and like if there's a project or my daughter has to do something for school and it's just like i can get really excited and get her excited and then we like spend hours doing something um or my partner like he's got into he he built a pond for us and like and then i got into koi fish and i'm like yeah and we're like studying all these things and how they do this and and then he loves it i get excited like i i kind of like jump in with him which is fun and i think it's so nice instead of just having like one kind of hobby or one singular way of looking at things um i think the yeah i think it's the drop of a hat excitement for me definitely in the creativity aspect i love I that love yeah <laughs> also you know where you were like I took a yoga lesson and it was a really great and I loved yoga. And then I was like, I'm going to become a yoga instructor. And now I have a business <laughs> you know, the way that we're just sort of like, we go, you, you know, you're just sort of like, Oh, I really like this. And then next thing you know, you kind of go in this fog and you emerge and you've got a website and a, mm. and a logo and you now have this business and you're like, okay, yes. this is me now, <laughs> yes. which can be frustrating. But I, you know, I think frustrating when we look at it as something that is, um, 
you know, that when we think of ourselves as terms of like, in terms of, you know, being consistent is a value. Yes. But I think when yes. we shed that and we get rid of that paradigm and that idea that we have to be consistent, it's an amazing talent to just mm. be like all in with things, with that enthusiasm, yes. like you said, yes. which I have, I'm learning, learning, it's a process, but I'm learning to love that about myself that like mm. I am, I, I will go like feverishly all in on things. <laughs> I think I'm, yeah. I'm enjoying it, especially now that my daughter's getting older. So I have more time to myself because I think I really, really struggled during the newborn stages, especially because I was a single mom at the time. Yeah. And I remember it's, it's almost like you want to do something, but the way I am when I do something is that I immerse myself in it and like hours go by and you can't do that when you have a newborn. So I would like want to do something and realize I couldn't do it for hours on an end. So I'd be like, eh, and then I just don't do anything. And like, it was just like, every day was just survival. It was just survival. <laughs> it's like ticking off like a list of like checkbox things to do and then repeat it the next day for like, it felt like the first three years. So now I'm like finally at a stage where she's doing play dates and it's just like, yeah, I can do things for hours on the end or she can join me. And it's just, I love it. Yeah, mm. I know. Right. Mm. Oh, I, I do not miss those days. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, uh, my, my brother has a one-year-old and they were visiting us this weekend and he's like, just started walking and they're at that age where you literally <sighs> just have to watch them that you cannot take your eye off of them or they will like accidentally no. kill themselves. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, I couldn't believe how exhausted I was after spending like one mm. hour with that. I wasn't even in charge. I was just watching it and I was like, oh my goodness, I do not miss those, that age. No. <sighs> yeah. Oh, no, well, that's you. lovely. So now with yeah. the, with yoga lisa can i so mm. let's talk about your business because i want to um i'm curious about the online yoga classes are you teaching mm. uh individually like do you take clients one-on-one -on -one yes. for private lessons and yes. is that basically that can be anywhere in the world right if the timing is yep. right yep. so uh yeah so where can people find you and and work with you well it's um yoga lisa dot online and that's that's the site um and it's the same on instagram and my email address is connect at yogalisa.online. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, it's, I've kind of built the site to be like a, like a, it's almost like an online shop where you just like add a, a session to cart and check out and there's PayPal and it's all really easy. Um, which is, I was thinking, like, as we were talking, you know, all the job hopping, it's really helped me in a way with my business because. I've been in engineering um, and so I've watched people build sites and I've tested, I've done software testing. So I know what to look for with like user experience and I've done design um, and I used to do blogs for this other company and like content management. And so it's all like, it's all coming in handy right now. And I've, I've done sales as well. So it's just like, yes, I've done all those things, but they weren't for no reason. Like, I feel like I've been, what's like extraordinary is that, yes, I've done so, I've been in like 11 different jobs, but I've been in completely different jobs that have like nothing to do with each other in different cultures. And I've managed to adapt into every single one of those and make it work. And like, I, I mean, in the, when I was testing, when I was doing software testing, I had no business doing that. I had no experience, but within the first year I got an award for like raising the bar and I got promoted and all those things. So like, it just shows you that you know, just because you do like a gazillion things, it doesn't mean that you are not successful. It just means that you're adding more strings to your bow, I think, essentially, and you can use it, <laughs> make a beautiful song out of it. I don't know. No, that is, it's yeah. beautiful. It is. And I yeah. think about that too, with, um, how, you know, my own history with like graphic design and how I bring that in and all mm -hmm. those things that are mm -hmm. so fun. Like, yeah, all of these crazy directions we've taken over the course of our life really just add up to that. The bow, that's a lovely image. I always mm -hmm. think of it as like the patchwork quilt, right? Of sort of who yes. we are and how it's so interesting to think of all the ways that everything makes perfect sense at the end of the day mm. <laughs> when you it look does. over the course of your life. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, well, that's so lovely. And I am I love the fact that I'm sitting here having a conversation with somebody from literally on the other side of the globe and that we... <laughs> Uh, are able to kind of find each other, right? Because I mm. feel like I'm a broken record when I talk about how important it is for us to find each other and to have these conversations with each other and to to realize we have this shared experience. And maybe it's ADHD. Mm. I think it is like, you know, the, but it's that mm. questioning and that um, 
that way in which we are kind of really just trying to get to the bottom of who we are and, uh, and, um, you know, uncovering the puzzle that is our brains, I think is, mm -hmm. is so interesting and why I'm so grateful for these conversations. And I, I learned so much from these interviews. So thank you so much for sitting oh, down with thank me and you sharing your story. <laughs> thank you for having me. Oh, <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to just hit stop.